long after that, uh, I received a call from uh, Gordon White from the New York Times. And Gordon used to write a lot about our tour. And I knew Gordon. And he said, Mary B., uh, would you, we'd like for you to come to the Metropolitan Golf Writers Dinner in New York, and we'd like to honor you for what you did. And I said, oh, well, thank you. That I, Sure, I'd love to come. And um, he said, but I have a, I have a question to ask and I have a favor to ask. And I said, what's that? And he said, uh, we'd like to name the award for you. <laughs> like, really? And uh, so they did. So I gave them permission. So that was the uh, favor. That yeah, was the favor. Was the favor. <laughs> oh, you're so good. <laughs> <laughs> most of us never learned how to train our brains, which is why most of us needlessly settle, struggle, and worse, suffer. My name is Chris Doris, and I want to make brain training mainstream. This is my series, Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm interviewing badasses from all walks of life on what mental toughness means to them and their unique approaches to strengthening their minds. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm your host, Chris Doris, and uh, our only housekeeping item, as usual, before we get to our amazing guest today is if you're not getting our, the Daily Dose Mental Toughness Tips in 30 seconds or less delivered to your email inbox at around 6 or 7 a.m. no matter where you are on the planet Earth every morning of the year, then let's resolve that issue because that's some golden, golden goodies. Uh, and if you're not getting notifications of my blog posts that go out every Tuesday, and if, of course, if you're not getting notifications of these new uh, Tough Talks podcast episodes, uh, which go live every other Thursday, then we can resolve that so virtually, effortlessly, by going to ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists, L-I-S-T-S, name, email, click, and the goodies are all yours. So, I am over the moon pumped to share this heroic woman and that's the, the word heroic is like it, like she is a hero uh with you today she is one of the most influential people in my world in my life um one of the great one of the greatest role models and just a true complete badass in the way that she has always chosen to live her life her name is mary b porter king and Mary B. grew up playing the game of golf and ended up playing here in Arizona at Arizona State University. She is the only, <laughs> she, she could be the only athlete in Division I sports history. Could be, I don't know. But she's definitely the only athlete in, in Arizona State University, which, which is a Division One, one of the most athletic, the most successful, and um, competitive athletic schools in history. Uh, she lettered in four sports. Like, how's that even possible? It, it was the, she lettered in uh, basketball, softball, volleyball, and of course golf. That's ridiculous. And she's in like all these halls of fame. You know, she played on the LPGA tour. There's a story which I cannot even give you any. Like, I, I want to give, to give you some teaser, but like, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I did a little bit of that in the writing about this episode, but it's just too good. I don't. I'm not. There's. I'm not. I can't share any of it with you to spoil any of it. It's too. It's un. Unbelievable. The story that she's gonna. I'm gonna ask her to. She will share with you about uh, an event that occurred during one of the the golf events that she was playing life-altering in, in, in every conceivable way. And uh, then she went on after her P LPGA career, after she um, retired from professional competitive golf, she uh, co-founded the Hawaii State Junior Golf Association. And, and that's how I know her. I was introduced to her by a dear friend, Tom Cunningham. Thank you, buddy. Love you, man. <laughs> uh, Tom Cunningham is the uh, retired executive director of the Junior Golf Association of Arizona, which was very, Tom and that organization was instrumental, instrumental in the development and evolution of my career. He introduced me to Mary B., who, you know, then invited me out to, uh, to do mental toughness training with the Hawaii State Junior Golf Association for like 15 years in a row, which was a, m okay, 
All right, if I have to go to Hawaii to do the work, I'll do it. <laughs> so, and that was amazing. She hosted me at her house several times, and, and, and she's just, just this wonderful human being. She served on the executive. She's the first player in the history of the game to serve on, to be elected to and serve on the executive board of the United States Golf Association, which is like epic. She's in the, you know, obviously ASU Hall of Fame, Hawaii Golf Hall of Fame. She's probably, it's probably be easier to list the number of halls of fame that she's not in than to list the number of ones that she is. And we are going to surprise her at the end of the episode. So don't bail. You're not going to bail. You can't, this is an episode where you're just not going to be. I, I know her so good. She tells her, she has endless stories. And she tells them beautifully. And uh, she's just full of love and service has changed. I would love to know how many hundreds of thousands of lives have been affected by the way she's chosen to live. And um, I cannot wait to give this surprise to her. So yeah, look forward to that. All right. Without further ado, let's go find Mary B. She's waiting for us. Where are you at, my dear friend? There she is, one of my absolute heroes in all of life, Mary B. Porter King. My dear friend, I have been looking forward to this episode of Tough Talk since before I started doing podcasting. Well, um, that's quite a pedestal you put me on. I hope I can, I hope I can stay up on it. You, well, you on. seem to have been doing that very effortlessly for a very long time. So I believe in you. <laughs> and, you know, I want to start out by acknowledging uh, the person who is the reason I know you. Uh, because uh, if not for him, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And if not for him I, and having not met you, I wouldn't have met a million other amazing human beings that I love. Uh, and that's Tom Cunningham. Tom Cunningham, the former executive director uh, of the Junior Golf Association of Arizona. And um, he watches all of these. So Tom, brother, love you so much. And thank you for this introduction, among all the others. Well, he, he was one of my mentors, I have to tell you, because the wow. program that he put on in Arizona is, is one to be followed for sure. He's done an amazing job through the years. We miss him. Oh, no, no question. No question. He and I, so he's on my daily dose. And uh, are you on, do you get my daily dose in the mornings? Okay. Nice. Very nice. They just so, have yeah. to change my name. If you don't mind, they, they keep calling me Mary. No. So I can do that in a minute. <laughs> it's called Mary. Yeah. I don't mind. So I don't respond. So <laughs> it's me. It's just me. <laughs> You can, send, you can send those people an angry note if you want. I will I'll send it to them. Stop calling me Mary. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, so um, raise your hand if you're the only athlete in the history of humans to a letter in four varsity sports at Division I athletics. Go ahead and raise well, your hand. I don't know in the history of the world. I do know in the history of Arizona State University that I would be the only one that lettered in four. Yeah. Or the only one that's in their Hall of Fame that lettered in four. So there may have been others, but I, I don't know that. Basketball, softball, volleyball, and golf. That's ridiculous. Well, it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't think you could do it today just because of limitations of athletes. I mean, what's so, so softball and golf? Like, which of those sports happened? So hoops and volleyball, they were both the same semester, right? And then go so golf. golf. Yeah, golf was year round. Um, mm. And so my golf coach knew uh, one of many golf coaches I had in my time at ASU. Uh, they knew that um, me, my, my, I'm sorry, my team sports coach, which was Mary Littlewood, Dr. Mary Littlewood, she she knew that golf was my number one sport, that if I had a conflict that I would go to golf. But I, I really don't remember that happening very rarely. And uh, we did win the national championships in golf and softball during my time. So, oh, which my. was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Pre I mean, pretty cool. Pretty cool. I mean, if you're into that kind of stuff. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I didn't think otherwise. I just figured everyone was doing that. I had a couple <laughs> girls on my softball team and actually a couple on my uh, golf team that played two sports, but not four. So. Not four. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're a remarkable human being. I know you're humble as hell, but I'm not going to tolerate that. 
today uh, because Uh-oh. no, just because look, you know, the whole reason this podcast exists is in service to people and you shine so bright the way that you choose to live and that you've always chosen to live is so powerful. I'm not asking you for, you don't have to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just, I'm, but I'm not going to be apologetic about enlightening people to your magnificence. Now, the, well, I don't know about that adjustment right there because there's something I want to, I want to, all right, first of all, let me acknowledge our history a little bit because it's, it's amazing to me. You're one of the most powerful people I've ever met and one of the most beautiful human beings I've ever, ever met in my life and gracious and generous. And uh, so because of Tom Cunningham, he introduced me to you. And, uh, and then you invited me out about 15 years in a row to come out and, and train the brains of all of the members of the Hawaii State Junior Golf Association, several of whom I'm still in close contact with. You and did a I mean, good job too. Well, I appreciate that. And, and you also, you know, what a cool week that was for me. It was closer to the beginning of my career than it is now. And uh, it was a cool week because I come out and I mean, you had, we had meetings on like, well, Oahu. And then I'd fly out the next day to Maui, back to Oahu, fly out the next day to the big island, hang out with big girl Tamia, get some Portuguese salsa sandwiches in the belly. <laughs> Gotta have those. No, no doubt. What a, that'd be a waste of a trip. Come back and then fly out to Kauai, to Lahui, which is where you're sitting right now in okay. heaven and you you hosted me there a few times and i gotta tell you where you're sitting is one of the most spectacularly beautiful places in the world you know that but your home is amazing your walls open up well I, they do and i'm gonna duck out of the way so you can enjoy it for a minute and see yeah. if you can all enjoy it and see yeah. what we see oh there you Let go look at, so you can't so look at that now is that your front yard it is of course it it's is. actually my backyard and there's a rainbow coming right now if you can see that oh. Oh, wow. Um, we, yeah, rainbow oh just, no just kidding, came really? down. Yep. So that's the backyard. Okay, so the backyard, is that where the Garden of Eden is? <laughs> well, this is a different house than the last time you were here, obviously. Are you kidding me? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> We've only, Why? The Garden, of, the Garden of Eden, we left there uh, about five, almost five years ago, oh. and uh, we moved down south. So this is the south side of, of uh, Kauai. Oh. And so we find this. No, uh, uh-uh, uh, we're we're on we're down in Kaloa, so okay. we're in the Poipu area. That people oh, might know that. wow! Yeah, Poipu area. Oh, oh, right on. Poi- wow, yeah. that's so. Wow. There's a, a wave coming in for you, and and that's acid drop for any surfers that are on the uh, acid drops just up to your as the as the wave came in, it sets over there. So there's always a lot of surfers there. Usually, there's a lot of cars there looking for the surf, and we just had a huge storm well it wasn't a huge storm we've had bigger come through that did bring some um you know big big waves i mean 20 to over 20 foot waves coming in that's so, that's ridiculous south shore i mean that's that's for people that don't know that's absurd like yes, 20 is. Foot waves is, is that's ridiculous well they had 1600 rescues on our island in one day with I mean, not our island around the state in one day which is really pretty scary i mean those rescues women, from from the water from the water you know yeah. i gotta tell you hawaii is simultaneously why don't you come on back in you want me to come back yes, i'm please. fine over here <laughs> just, I you stand there, they're waiting for an invite i'm over here having my coffee but that's exactly. just taking care of it yours yeah, and whatever dogs. whatever <laughs> But Hawaii is simultaneously one of the most spectacularly beautiful and serene places, but also simultaneously one of the most dangerous places I've ever been. It can be because we have uh, we're the oldest of the island chain. So we have the most white sand beaches and uh, we don't have the number of lifeguards to protect all those beaches. And so a lot of tourists come and they see these beautiful miles and stretches of beautiful white sand and surf and they say, wow, let me go out there. And unfortunately, they, we've got strong undertoes, undercurrents. That, mm, mm. Um, and, they're, and they're not used to the, this kind of water. They might be in lakes or, or the Atlantic Ocean down in Florida or something that's not, doesn't have this kind of breaks. And, uh, and we have a lot of lava rock. So when they, they go down into areas they shouldn't go and they, a big wave comes in and washes them up on the lava. And I have to tell you, that doesn't feel good. No, yeah, so very dangerous. But they just—they try to warn them just to make sure you go to a beach that 
has a lifeguard, but they don't, unfortunately. Uh, one of the stupidest things I've ever done in my life, I did in Hawaii, and it was uh, <laughs> around Hanoma Bay. Yep. And it was around the corner from Hanoma Bay, which I think only the locals really knew about. You know what toilet bowl is? Mm-hmm. Well, right next to toilet bowl, toilet bowl is not the dangerous thing that I did. Uh, there was a, a little hole in the ground. So blow hole. It wasn't even a blow, it well, a blow hole. It could have been a blow hole, but it was just a hole. And I'm hanging out in toilet bowl, which is pretty relaxing. Actually, I was with some locals. Uh, that's the same people I stay with every time I came out. Yeah. Right? The Zygowitzes that live in Hawaii Kai. And uh, that hosted me every time, right? And um, so we're just hanging out in, at toilet bowl, which is, for those that don't know, it's this big hole in the ground, a lava rock, and there's an underwater source. So when the waves come in, it fills it up. And you jump in, and then you go down to the bottom. You're standing on soft sand. Water comes in, and it raises you up. It's very, and you just go sit down on the edge. It's kind of fun. But I'm looking over to the right, and there's these locals. And there's these two local dudes um, laying on the ground next to this hole. And then one just goes in head first and is gone. Thanks. Gone. So naturally, that got my attention. And then, I, you know, so I go over and ask the guy, where did he go? <laughs> and he said, he's over there. And he points out into, into the, the not, I guess it's the ocean, but it's like where the water's coming in. So he, he swam underground in a lava tube. And the guy said, you got to try it. And I said, you're out of your damn mind. Why would I ever do that? He goes, it's amazing. Yeah. So he goes in and then the other guy comes back and I'm getting the, the whole like, oh, am I going to, is this going to be a what if I wonder if thing, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it, this was a stupid move. It, in retrospect, it turned out it worked out pretty great. So they gave me instruction on how to do it. I went down head first. They said, they, they, I said, what do you do? Like, how does this work? And they said, just go down and then your hands will hit the sand. Look up. You'll be in a, like a tube, which is pretty big. And you'll see the light just swim. And you'll come out over there. And I said, all right. So I went. So the water comes. They said, go in when the water comes up. So the water comes up and I don't go and it goes down. And they just look at each other. Water comes. About the third time I finally went. And sure enough, just like they described it. And I looked up and there's light at the end of the tunnel i started swimming. I was swimming like a nut though i'm not enjoying any of this i'm just freaking out so i'm not in a state of appreciation and then what they didn't tell me was that when the water comes back in you're going to go backwards that's when i really freaked out but then when the water came out it shot me out like a torpedo oh thank god came out in the water and, and it was it was spectacular but <clears throat> They, they neglected to tell you needed to hold your breath for five minutes. <laughs> it was actually probably 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so many great stories. You just reminded me of a guy that I met named Paris when I was doing a gig on Oahu. Uh, he was, he had a patch. He was a free diver. And uh, he would tell me how he would dive down and speak. Like hold his breath for like five minutes. He'd train and train and train and hold your breath and go down and like shoot like swordfish. Craziness. Back to you. <laughs> yes, sir. I like talking about others. <laughs> so, well, okay. So we we can check that box now. Okay. So, uh, you know, when I was doing my, I didn't, I probably didn't need to do any research on you, but I researched everybody that uh -huh. I, and I learned, to, I don't know if I learned anything new, but I, in my research of you in the last couple of days, I definitely clarified. I have been telling some of your stories wrong but only for like 20 years. Um, but, I, but I got the, the points right, like the gist of them, right? The mean, but the details, I, I definitely messed up a bit. But um, one of the things that I saw in my research is an absolutely spectacular picture of you and Arnie. Can you tell us about your relationship with Arnold Palmer? Well, most of it. Um, yeah, I... <laughs> as a, as a young young professional, um, I was fortunate to be signed by IMG yeah, and Mark McCormick's group <clears throat> out of Cleveland. And uh, in doing so, Mark, uh, he set up a lot of extra visits for us around the world, uh, things that we did. And, and a lot of times, because there weren't that many of us, was Arnold and Jack and Gary and um, Mike Suchek and some amazing, you know, players. And then uh, Jan Stevenson and I and 
a couple or Bob, we were on the IMG staff or crew, whatever, and under their management. So they would send us to different outings uh, for all over. And uh, so I got to spend time with him kind of away from a golf course and, and doing different things and different social functions. And, you know, one of the things, and you always hear the story and you wonder, is it really true that he spent that much time with young people explaining why it's so important to treat your fans um, kindly and which he did and how important it is to sit. And if they ask you for an autograph, first of all, you look them in the eye and you thank them. And secondly, if they do ask for your autograph, you sign it so they can read it. It's it's legible. So if you've noticed, even to the very end of Arnold's life, uh, he signed, he worked to sign his autograph. It's the same as from when he was a young man to the end. And, uh, and he felt that was very important. And he, and he felt a lot of things were very important about the game and mostly it's traditions and it's etiquette and the way you treat people. And he, he truly recognized that he didn't have a job without fans. And he knew that, I mean, he could play the best game ever, but if people weren't there to watch him and, and follow him, he had nothing. And so he, he really, um, he, he tried, he, he didn't try, he did make sure that he spoke to all of us uh, younger players and explain the importance of being kind, spending time with people, how important pro-ams were for us. Mm. And, um, and I, I took that away and he, you know, I had many special moments with him. Um, uh, I was there, which was very sad. I'll start crying when he played his last round at Augusta. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, a rules official in those that year. And uh, he came down on the 15th hole and you can hear him all the way around the golf course. And, <laughs> and you know, you can hear oh, he's, him coming. he's coming. And uh, yeah, it just was very, very emotional. Just knowing that that was, you know, his last, last walk. So, but he did come back and played the par three and, and uh, it, it didn't matter what he shot. Um, it was just that he was there and yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I got to spend time. I was just with his daughter, Amy, oh. uh, in Geneva two weeks oh, ago. Yeah. The Palmer cup. Arnold Palmer cup. And the purpose of that is really to make sure that I, and those of us, um, that feel the same as Arnold, that we continue to carry on those traditions that he felt so strongly. And uh, I don't want that to get lost. I want to make sure that what he believed, and not just Arnold, but almost all the old players, um, I hate to say the word old, but, um, you know, that they strongly believed Legends. that, that yeah, they, they weren't playing the game for money. Trust me. Um, they were playing the game because they loved the game. And it was a passion. And that they cared about it. They cared about the golf course. They cared about how they played and how they were perceived. And, and uh, that was the most important. It wasn't, you know, I mean, I laugh when people say, you know, Oh, you play for the money. Well, first of all, we, we didn't play for money really yeah. so little what we no, played we, for. We really, really. Yeah. Didn't. <laughs> we we you know, might I, have wanted to, but we, we really didn't. Yeah. We would like to, have, but we didn't, you know? And so, um, you know, it just, uh, that's my, I have lots of special memories of Arnold. Um, and he was so kind to me. And as I say, you know, he was either your, your brother, your father, your grandfather, your uncle, just, you know, he just, that's how he treated everybody that you were important to him. Um, and uh, I'll tell you one other special story that had to do with my father. My father uh, passed away a couple of years ago at age 98. So he had a very good life, but he and Arnold had had dinner. And I'm going to say it was probably in the sixties somewhere. And, um, he, I, I was fortunate to take him to Augusta and those were the years I was officiating. And I brought my dad and, uh, I, I saw my dad said, Oh, if you see Arnold, I'd sure love to say hi. And I said, okay. And as you know, you can't have a cell phone around Augusta. So first of all, my dad didn't have a cell phone, so I couldn't have found him. <laughs> but um, 
I see Arnold in the clubhouse and I said, you know, Arnold, when my dad's here and before I even got that out of my mouth, I said, well, I'd love to see your dad and talk to him, you know? And so I, I had to go scramble to find him. Well, he came with me. He came with me to find him oh, and, wow. and they must've talked for 30 minutes. And, um, you know, he didn't need to do that, you know, in the middle of the week. And then as the week went on, uh, the par three tournament was coming and I was there. I had one of my nephews there and we're walking across the lawn and I would just taken them into the, one of the cabins and, and, uh, we'd come out and here came Arnold and Jack down the hill and Arnold sees me and sees my dad. And he says, Jack, I want you to meet Mary B's dad. <laughs> So they, they come down the hill to us, and I thought my nephew was going to die. Um, he, his mouth dropped, and, and here the both came, and Arnold introduces Jack to my dad. And uh, it just, you know, he, that's who he was. Uh, he, he really had a huge heart, cared about people, and he cared about the game. So, Well, hence his affection for you. <clears throat> Uh, because you could just, you, you, that same sentence is you, you describing you, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and the way that I'm sure thousands of humans have described you. Mm -hmm. I describe you. <laughs> so um, I know you've told the story a billion times, but there's a reason for that. Uh -huh. You're a billion and one. Can you take us back to 1988 at Moon Valley, which is right here? Yep. And you, um, you were playing... And the event that is, well, it's actually still hosted here. It's not the same mm -hmm. name of the tournament, <clears throat> but um, you didn't really miss left, did you, very much? <laughs> well, actually, left was my bad shot. <laughs> it was your, I, it was your, I, your I, bad I, shot. I, I'm a big, yeah. Well, there's I, no such thing as bad shots. There's only no. one. Oh, this was a great shot. So no. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, every shot is perfect for a certain circumstances. For, for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so how about you take it from there? So you're okay. Playing. Well, I was there to qualify, which was oddly, it was on a Wednesday. Normally you have a qualifying. I uh, wasn't eligible for the tournament in Arizona, which was the Good Samaritan Classic of all things. Yeah. And, oh, uh, man. I, I didn't even put that together. Okay. Hold that, everyone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Foreshadowing. So at this, um, I, I uh, was playing and I was playing with two other girls and caddies and off we're going. And I was just rolling along, singing a song. I was even going through 13. They had reversed the nines when we played there. For those people that know Moon Valley Country Club, but it's a par five and it was reachable for me. I, uh, in my young day, I was longer and uh, I don't say I was straighter. I was certainly longer. I could be long and wrong, but I was longer. Um, and um, I, popped up my tee shot. So I knew I didn't have a chance to hit it in two. So I had to lay up because there was a water out on the right. And so I, I and I'm not <laughs> laying up wasn't my name either. I, I sort of emulated Arnold like that. There was no layup in me. I wanted to always go for it, but which wasn't too smart at times. But when I went to lay fun. up, huh? but it was fun. <laughs> it was fun though. Yeah. It's when you made it, it was the best part. So yeah. Anyway, I pulled the heck out of that shot. And as you know, living in Arizona, they uh, kind of have the where we irrigate and kind of a little ditch. And I was so far left that, of course, I didn't have yardage. And uh, it was right next to a fence, the wrought iron fence in the backyard, just all the homes going down. It was 13 uh, as we played it. Lucky 13. And uh, mm -hmm. I, oh, man, the details. <laughs> all the little details so at this um my caddy and i walked it off and uh, i walked off it was 101 yards to the to the hole my caddy stayed at the green and i continued back my two fellow competitors hit up on the green with their caddies and yada yada so as i'm walking back i notice a man fully clothed in black clothing jump into a pool and i well, so I'm counting, counting and looking and trying to figure out why is he jumping at a pool? Well, as I look, uh, his son is floating face down in the pool. So for whatever reason, I thought I should be involved and go help. And uh, I was a mother of a young child at that time, uh, actually a year older than this child. And uh, 
Joseph. Uh, we'll get Joseph, to. my son, Joseph. And uh, so I ran and as I did, I flipped my cleats off because we wore cleats in those days. And uh, but it's a wrought iron fence. So the only crossbars were at six feet and three inches, you know, six inches. So I couldn't get over my caddy and my two fellow competitors. And they're all looking at me like, why is Mary B hanging on the fence? You know, the, yeah. there's a restroom right over here. You know, <laughs> it's like, what, what is she doing? Yeah. So I'm yelling at my caddy to come help me. And, and uh, he does. But at that point, the father had jumped in and pulled his son out of the pool. And he did probably what you shouldn't do. And he was shaking him upside down, I think, just to get the water out of him. And um, at this, my caddy Wayne arrives and I do what any red blooded American girl would do. I put my knee out and my hands out to lift his six foot four, 225 pound man over. And he just grabbed me by the shin and shot me over the fence. And when I landed uh, on the other side, Mr. Smucker was their name, uh, handed me a son who had no life, it had no life. Your, your hands and your knees? I was, yeah. So I had a glove on in my left hand, my oh. right hand. Uh, so it's all the cleachy we have in Arizona, all that fine little pebbles. And so I landed down on my hands and knees and he hands them to me. And I did what I thought. I really didn't know CPR and I could, we could go on for an hour because I could tell you every millisecond thought I have when I get into the story. But it, uh, I thought about my uncle who dropped dead on, at Mesa Country Club many years ago when I was in college and the dentist behind him broke his uh, ribs, giving him compressions. And I didn't know, I, I, I really didn't know CPR. So I did what I thought I should do. And he had food in his mouth and I just thought maybe he choked on something, but he had, he was flatter than a pancake and not a, not a nice color um, and no color really. And uh, so I started uh, mouth to mouth, but I forgot to hold his nose and I've got air on my face. And I'm like, what, what is wrong? Why, why am, why, again, why are you so stupid? What do you, <laughs> you've got to get this right. And uh, he looked just like my son, which was even made it more difficult. And uh, so I finally got the mouth to mouth right, holding his nose, but I didn't know the head tilt uh, at that time. And this is all different now. This is what they taught you then because your tongue goes back in your throat and I had to hold his tongue and, and uh, I wasn't getting any heartbeat. That's, so I didn't know what to do. And after many, many attempts of mouth to mouth, um, I decided the only way to maybe stimulate his heart would be to slug him. And I picked him up off the caliche and gave him a really good pop right over the heart. And uh, um, so at that point, he all of a sudden that he jumped and then he went flat again. And so I went back to mouth to mouth and then all of a sudden he started spewing. And um, in the meantime, my caddy, Wayne, is trying to explain to the mother how to call for help. They were Amish and they had just driven across the United States to visit the two fathers, the gentleman who owned the house and the father of Jonathan were cousins and they grew up together in the Amish community. Jonathan, the family, by the way, is the yeah. name of the child. But that yeah, was Jonathan child. Is, the, is the child. And uh, they grew up together. And uh, ironically, uh, fortunately, really, the only person that could swim there was Mr. Smucker. Um, and because he, his two younger daughters were there and his wife, um, Jonathan, Jonathan was the youngest of seven children they had. Oh, wow. And um, it, it was a surreal scene because, um, and I want to put words in their mouth, but basically I think they believe that whatever happens in life, it happens. And uh, his two daughters just sat on the bench on their lounge chairs with their hands folded. I would have never heard them or had I not had direct sight, I would have never seen them. Or if I'd hit a really good shot, I would have never seen them. And uh, so... <laughs> I'm sure, according to Jonathan, that was it the best shot of your life. Well, that was the best exactly. shot of his life of yours. <laughs> <laughs> it was the best shot of my life, too. Yeah. So, nice, nice. Um, so anyway, I at this point, my caddy's trying to explain to the mother um, how to dial a telephone. 
because they don't have phones. And he said, you know, pick it up, it's the nine and the one and the one. And she said, no one answered. So he said, call the, hit the bottom number, the zero at the bottom operator answered, but they don't know where you are. And so at this, I have Jonathan somewhat, he's, he's very full of fluids and, and can hardly breathe. I have him to the side and um, uh, I hear the mother say, no, we don't need any help. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know about you, but I need help. Um, and yes, I do need help. Uh, so I said, don't hang up the phone. And I went and handed Jonathan to his father and Mr. Smucker holds him out like, I don't know, he's holding him like this and Jonathan's head's back. And I'm like, I run and grab the phone. The operator said, where am I? I said, I'm on the 13th Holt Moon Valley. <laughs> I don't know where I am. Yeah. And um, so I, I stepped outside and asked both mom and dad, where what's your address well I didn't know they didn't live there and neither one knew and I then being a girl scout I went back by the phone and found a piece of mail and uh, I was 117 West Boca Raton so I said she said we're on our way and I said what do you want me to do and she said help the mother and I'm I'm going to help Jonathan so I went and got Jonathan from the father and uh, anyway I don't need to get into all the gory details but um, he there's a lining in your lungs that needs to come out when you've drowned. It's a, and that we slough off daily, apparently. And that had come out and I didn't know what it was. And at this, I hear all the sirens coming Four emergency vehicles arrive at the house at once because they were waiting to see which way to turn out of their driveway. And uh, they were just the nicest people. They had a baby respirator. They knew it was a child and, and uh, they whisked them from me, went back to the ambulance and, uh, I was just standing in the middle of the yard by myself <laughs> until this policeman arrives. And you know, my son who's six foot seven, he, this guy was six foot seven, but he was like 300 pounds. And the top of his gun was about eye level to me. And uh, he started asking me questions. And I thought, oh my, I, I hope Arizona's a good Samaritan state. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble because um, I didn't know. And he starts asking me, like, what was I doing there? And I, well, I, I hit a bad shot. I'm playing in that tournament. <laughs> so tournament going on over there. And, and uh, yeah, I just, I hit a bad shot and came over the fence and here I am. And so he took all the details. And at this, uh, Mr. Smucker comes out. And uh, now, mind you, he's all wet. I'm wet only from holding Jonathan uh, because what had happened they had fallen asleep by the edge of the pool and because it was a beautiful March day and, you know, it was cold, but it, the sun was shining. And for them, from, they're from Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, it was beautiful. And all of them fell asleep and Jonathan was on the edge of the pool and just walked right in and came up floating. And then I'll forward and tell you what, what he remembers, but um so I gave my police report and finally my caddy shows up with my shoes. He has my shoes and, you know, I'm sitting on the lawn. He said, here, I, I'll, I didn't even know how to tie my shoe at that point. And he said, oh, I'll, I'll put your shoes on. And then my question was, do I have to go back over the fence? He said, no, I found another way. And I said, okay. He had gone one other way to his left and there was a big watchdog there a shepherd so he didn't want to go that way he went right. the other way so as we're leaving um at the uh neighbors two women neighbors show up and they said to us so was it your ball and i said what was it your ball that killed the little boy and i went what <laughs> I thought I thought Wayne was going to come unglued to them, uh, but he did. He did, and then he, just, he went off, you know. And it, so he was explaining, "No, no," and he's not a little there. clarification there, a little yes. clarification moment. <laughs> and it's this there. out of out of the bush comes Mr. Smucker, and you know he's he's got his big shoes on that are full of water, and he and he's so soaking wet, and he comes and he reaches in his back pocket and he pulls out a checkbook, and I'm thinking, okay, what? what number would you put on a check? I, you know, uh, but what he was doing me uh, again, they're Amish. Uh, he had no phone number, 
but he had a rural route number. And he said, we live in Rocks, Pennsylvania, and we'd love for you to visit us if uh, you're ever in that area. Well, we played Hershey. He played the Hershey mm-hmm. Classic in those days. And so I was in that area and did get to go visit them. And um, so fast forward from that, uh, I went, Wayne got me back to the golf course with my shoes. And I still have my glove on that's just loaded with rocks. This hand is loaded with rocks. My knees are loaded with rocks, but I don't know that at this point. <laughs> I was pretty numb. And we get back to the ball. And now I, the one thing I will tell you, two groups played through me in the time we were gone. Yeah, I was wondering this whole time, how much time? I mean, that sounds like a day. It was a long time. And it seemed like eternity to me because every second was about life. And uh, so I will only tell you the one player, one player stopped to see if they could help. And that was Meg Mallon. And uh, Meg used to babysit for my son and they're still very close. Oh, nice. uh, and Meg was not in the following week was our Tucson tournament. I was in Tucson, Meg wasn't. And uh, so she stopped to help. And apparently at that point I was on the phone and she said, well, I figured Mary B's on the phone. Everything's under control. <laughs> now the two girls I played with, they were not happy with me. Didn't have much to say. They never came to see if I needed help or what was going on. They just stayed at the green with their caddies. And uh, fortunately Wayne was the only one to come help me, but um, we went back to the ball to hit it. And I said, how far is it? And he says 101. And I went 101. You could have told me coffee cup, you know, that's what it meant to my brain. I don't, what's the coffee cup? (laughs) What do you do with that? (laughs) How do I hit that? uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He gave me a clean glove and I, I kept asking him, how far is it? And he said, just hit this, hit this. I said, okay. So I hit it and I hit it really well. I hit it right at the flag and the little gust of wind comes up and it's kind of quivering. And I said, Oh, please, God, don't go in the bunker. And it goes in the bunker. (laughs) And then I start laughing. I said, why would God even worry about my golf ball? That is just the dumbest thing I think I've ever said. Why would that matter where my golf ball went? And I made bogey there and I missed the cut by one shot. Mm. And because I went to ASU and played all those sports, the media listens to all emergency calls in Arizona. And, and so they knew my name. And the next thing I know, by the time I got to 18, the parking lot was full of all, every media truck in the, in the valley. Wow. So Meg came to me because I was supposed to pick up my son um, from daycare. And uh, Meg came and says, listen, I'll go pick up Joseph and I'll just see you later at the house. I said, fine. I said, I'll take your clubs. I said, that's fine. Take my clubs. So she took my clubs and off she went. Well, I was there until 10, till the, after the 10 o'clock news doing media. And so I go to leave my car keys are in my golf bag and uh, Meg has to wake up Joseph, bring her back, bring him back and I go home, but I still haven't packed to go to Tucson. I thought I'd have plenty of time. I still have to drive to Tucson. And of course I have a morning time Mm. and uh, I drive and I have private housing. So it's, you know, hello, I'm showing up at two in the morning. Um, And so I got down there and I show up at the course for my tea time and everyone knew about it. Um, And I walk in the locker room and um, out uh, say Alice Miller. Um, hang on. Martin Hagee's sister, Alice Bauer, one of our founding members was in the locker room. Just, she had come to see everyone. She lived in Arizona and she had handwritten a petition, making me the 145th player to get into the good Samaritan classic the next week. Every player signed it along with our commissioner, wow. John Lopheimer, of which I still have. Oh, nice. um, yep. Yeah. And uh, so I was made the 145th player into the field. So 145th uh, player. So what was your group? Did, how many people were there? Did I think they, they took a, they, they could, yeah, 145. They, um, yeah, they obviously broke them down. Um, just okay. tease, but, and then not long after that, uh, I received a call from uh, Gordon White from the New York Times. And Gordon used to write a lot about our tour. And I knew Gordon and he said, Mary B, uh, would you, we'd like for you to come to the Metropolitan Golf Writers Dinner 
in New York, and we'd like to honor you for what you did. And I said, oh, well, thank you. That I'm sure I'd love to come. And um, he said, but I have, a, I have a question to ask, and I have a favor to ask. And I said, what's that? And he said, uh, we'd like to name the award for you. <laughs> like, really? And uh, so they did. So I gave them permission. So that was the uh, favor. That was the that favor. Was the favor. <laughs> oh, you're so. <laughs> they owe you. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I said I would be honored. So I, I actually just went to the dinner again this year. I, I try to go as much as possible, but it's, it's given for one a heroic act and or two a humanitarian act. And if those of us all old enough to remember, Greg Norman uh, had a young boy with Make a Wish Foundation, Jamie Hutton that same year after my incident and uh, Greg ended up winning the event. This boy had childhood leukemia and uh, they flew him in to watch Greg. And then Greg wins the tournament and hands the boy the trophy. And, and it was happily there after. So I, I try to go back as much as I can. And what did you name the award after you was the name of the award? It's very catchy. It's Mary B. Porter Humanitarian Award. Yeah. <laughs> um, so and this year's recipient was just another one that made everyone cry. Um, it, it's very cool that a, a young man who was the caddy master, which I've heard we're not supposed to call them caddy masters anymore. But anyways, the caddy master at a great club in uh, New Jersey at Knickerbocker. And um, he, the young man who's their assistant pro there, had a degenerative kidney disease and had never told anybody basically he was on dialysis went three days a week for six hours after work and showed up early to work and and he decided that he wanted to donate his kidney and not knowing if he it would be a match uh, he knew that it would move him up on the recipient list but he didn't know if he'd be a match well they ended up they were a match and it, the doctor said you, you could be a brother by another mother he said you're so close and so he donated his kidney with the permission of his family. And um, it was very, very touching. It was pretty cool what people do in the game of golf. So every year, it's, it's another amazing story. Every year that happens in New York City? It does. Just outside. It's usually up in Westchester area. Okay. Uh, it was at Westchester Country Club this year. It was at Wingfoot last year. Oh, wow. It's going to be at Sleepy Hollow next year. How good does that feel for you to know that that's going on? Like, and that's uh, part of your unbelievable legacy. <laughs> it's very, very special. I, I say if I, if I'm remembered for that, um, you know, that, that would be amazing. And uh, I did make mention when I, uh, cause there's some great awards there. There's the Dave Marr award and there's, you know, after different writers and, and I said, I don't know if anyone's noticed this, but um you know, all these awards tonight are given for some amazing people that have done so many great things in the game of golf and, but are no longer with us. And I am the only one still alive. So I'm going to make sure I stay that way <laughs> for as long as yeah, I can. That. Please do. <laughs> I'm working on that. <clears throat> you know, the reason that this, this, this podcast is part of my legacy is similar. You know, I'm going to leave goodies for folks. And so every episode you know, I want to make sure that I work with my guest to um, to slow down and expand moments. Moments that, that could be overlooked, and, but there's moments. These moments are life altering. And the moment here, obviously, is the decision that you made to go help, to go serve. Now, I know you already said it. You say it all the time and it's beautiful. It's part of your and I know you mean it too, that any red blooded human would have done. Yeah. Right. Uh, but there was still a decision and maybe not everybody. No, you know what? It's not accurate. Not every person would have done that. And you know, it's true. I'm, you know, I'm not asking you to say it, but it's true. Not everyone would have done that. So what I'm, I, you know, as one of the many takeaways from our conversation already, I would like it if you're willing, if you can remember even like to the, there was a moment where you made a choice. And that choice has changed not just Jonathan's life, yours, and then thousands upon thousands of others who were inspired by the story. There was an award created because of it. Now all these people are acknowledged and all, you know, all these beautiful, heroic and humanitarian gestures, the decisions are being celebrated because you made one. 
Can you remember that moment? Yes. Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, it, the, it, the whole the whole incident is very clear. I mean, we're talking about 1988. So, yeah. I mean, it, um, it's good that I have a memory um, <laughs> at this point. But, um, yeah, I do. I, I didn't. I didn't think, I didn't really look at it as a choice to tell you the truth. Um, I, it, cause it was, uh, and, and I wasn't prepared. I mean, I really wasn't prepared. I didn't go into it thinking, geez, um, maybe I shouldn't go because I don't even know CPR, it, but mm. I know that I'm going to do something to make sure he lives. And that was, I said, if I got into the millisecond thoughts of this, that, you know, I, I went down the lane of what would I do if I, he didn't live, you know, how would that affect my life? Mm. Um, mm. And that motivated me more, you mm. know, and that he looked like my child. He looked like my son. Mm. They're a year apart. Um, and, uh, you know, that uh, I, I knew I could do it. I knew I could do it. But um, there... And there was just, there wasn't, I don't necessarily really a choice or a, um, it was, I saw it and I knew that I needed to go and that I, I can see myself running towards the fence and hanging there and feeling desperate that I can't get myself over this fence. And that when I did go over um, that, okay, here he is. And his father walked away from me. He left me with his son in my arms and went and, went and but, sat down. So yeah. I, yeah. So I'm going to hypothesize that your ability to have that be, as you're describing it, like an auto response is the result of probably years and years and years and years of making difficult decisions that would permit you to, first of all, be a four letter athlete at D one school. Like you understand hard. <laughs> right? You're a professional golfer. How many people want that to be true for them? So you understand uh, improbability. You understand impossibility and you deny it. So I think that you're the rehearsals that you've had by virtue of choosing to do the stuff, to do the work throughout your life resulted in you having that auto response of uh, heroism. That could be. I mean, you know, life isn't always easy. I, I, I know that in this. In, and I do believe that we get stronger from um, from our problems. Not to take away for look, you're one of the yeah. kindest human beings in the world. <laughs> you, you know, so, so maybe it's not even accurate, but I'm sure that that all the efforts didn't hurt. Oh, you yeah. got your master's mug right there. Yeah, sorry. Is that a little is that a Yeti? Um, I think so. I'll wait till I get to the bottom and I'll tell you. Those are so good. Well, thanks for sharing that. <clears throat> so yeah. fast forward 10 years, right? And um, so you're, you're done with your, your LPGA career and you founded the Hawaii State Junior Golf Association. Why'd you do that? Well, I felt there was a need. Um, I was very fortunate. Oh, Mary B., I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. There was one last, my bad. Uh -oh. I'm sorry to interrupt you. There was one last question I forgot to ask you uh -oh. about that story. You're still in touch with Jonathan Smucker, whose life you saved. I do. Uh, so <clears throat> a couple instances, the Metron Golf Writers invited him to the dinner. Uh, and he mm. was probably six, maybe mm. at that time, very young. And again, How old they, was he when you saved him? He was three. He was three. Okay. He was three. Mm -hmm. And um, we did go visit them. As I mentioned, they did invite us. They, we did go visit them. And the, his yeah. mother, um, he made him a new shirt and they used straight pins for buttons. And uh, we went to their farm. Uh, the mother was probably, I don't even know if she was 40 years old, but she seemed to be much older just because of the work she had to do to, raise their food and raise their children, no power, no electricity and a horse drawn buggy and, you know, plowing with a horse. And, uh, it was, it was really interesting and, and made you so appreciative of what you have. But, mm. um, the, when Mr. Smucker passed, all the children left that lifestyle mm. and the mother. Mm. So oh. they're devout Christians and, but they're not living in that lifestyle. So, 
fast forward, he, Jonathan, his mother, and I think his sister, Anna, had come to the Metropolitan Golf Writers Center, and it was so, uh, and, they, and they're dressed in their Amish attire, and it was just, it was a little awkward, but fast forward, um, one of the years with the PGA of America, they have an award that's called the First Lady of Golf, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be the recipient of which my junior golfers think that I was the first lady to ever play golf, but it's <laughs> another, another story, but oh, God. sometimes I feel like it, but you know, Pretty so, uh, as a surprise to me, they flew Jonathan and his then fiance to Florida for the awards dinner, um, for the award ceremony. And, uh, Oh, and that was very emotional. And they did the most beautiful video of which Arnold's in. Arnold oh, nice. Spoke, and it, it's, Is it's, that video available to be seen online? Uh, it was. Um, I could probably send you a link to it. I, I would love that. that. I would love that so I could include it in the okay. show. For this I'll program. see if I can get it for you. All right. Um, yeah. So, and then, so Jonathan and I, and of course, Facebook and everything else became you know, more popular as time went on. And I, I connected with him and 19, I believe it was October of 19. I decided as a gift to me, I'm going to fly Jonathan and his then three children to Hawaii for a week as a gift wow. to me. And so I flew them all out and they spent a week here in this <laughs> house where you haven't been yet. Oh, and, okay. uh, yeah, yet being the operative word. Yeah, that. That's the operative word. And, um, that was the greatest gift. So Jonathan just had his uh, 38th birthday the other day, 38th birthday uh, in June. And uh, of course, I'm always in touch with them. And, you know, he considers me, uh, he, he always says that um, I have two sons, you know, one I one I gave life and I say one I gave birth and one I gave life. So, oh, that's nice. So. Yeah, it's very nice. So wow. How I beautiful. do stay in touch with him, and he's just the nicest young man, and he's a farrier of all things. Wow. Um, do you know what that means? Wait a minute. A, a farrier. Farrier. No. He shoes horses, and he shoes oh, racehorses. Wow. Oh, and uh, yeah, it's a, a, a great job, a very difficult job, because I mean, and he's, he's a kind of a slight guy, but he is rock solid. <laughs> and he shoes racehorses. And um, so he moves from kind of the Pocono area, the, you know, uh, Pennsylvania down to Florida with where the races go. And uh, that's cool. And they're expecting their fourth child. Yay. So, yep. So, well, Jonathan, if you happen to be watching that, congratulations to you. Yep. All yep. of them. For all, yep. all of that. I'm so glad I asked that last clarification question. So yep. thank you. Now back to the one where, now, where were we? <laughs> well, I interrupted you immediately after having asked you this question. <laughs> well, so in um, what 1998, you founded the Hawaii State Junior Golf Association. Mm -hmm. Why? Why did you do that? Yeah, and I was one of the core co-founders. There were four of us. Okay. Uh, okay. That decided that it was time because uh, there was nothing here in in Hawaii that you know where, where they gave kids an opportunity and. We have challenges here, but they weren't anything I didn't feel we couldn't overcome. Um, when I grew up in California, I was playing tournaments every day, all summer long, um, mm. you know, for two dollars and you'd get a hot dog and a drink. And, you know, you were at the you were there all day and somebody would drop you off and in a station wagon full of eight kids with clubs and, you know, with our little canvas bags and and they would pick you up. 10 hours to 12 hours later in the dark and you'd go home. And if you were lucky, someone would ask you how you did today, you know, but usually it was just, it's your turn to do dishes. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but we played and we made great friendships and we play around the green. So I didn't see that here. And, and yes, we have challenges because we're islands um, and it's yeah. difficult. It's expensive. So I tried to create ways to create competition for them that was inexpensive. And, and this was before 9-11, obviously. And so, uh, and then those days you could fly in or island for 20, $25, you know, mm. uh, it was cheap. And uh, we had very minimal 
entry fees. And so we, a, a parent could drop their child off at an airport, fly to another island. We'd pick them up, take them, we'd feed them lunch, and we'd take them back in a bus to the airport, put them on a plane and send them home. And we were just playing one day events to do that, to create inner island competition. But unfortunately, 9-11 happened. And um, I was a lot in Poipu, of actually, on 9-11. Sorry? I was in Poipu and on, on the 9-11. Oh, were you? Yeah. Why weren't you at our house? You should have been at our house. We, I, you mean in- I was here. I was, yeah, doing, I, guess, I was doing a gig. Sorry, I was thinking of Nikki. So yeah, 9-11. Yeah. Anyway. No, it was not, not fun. So- That's really cool though, like for the kids, for a lot of them, right? To, I mean, yeah. right? The puddles, oh, that was, those are fun. They're cool. Yeah. Those scary. yeah, it was great fun. And, 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 oh, it, so and also- Huh? It, well, it created a sense of confidence in them, mm. um, of which I'm like pros. Yeah, I'm like a big deal, you know. Yeah, yeah, hey, I'm off figure. today to play, you know, over at Waikoloa, or today I'm yeah. going to Hualalai, and you know, I'm yeah. going to Poipu Bay, and yeah. so it, it was a great thing. And I also got uh, uh, some national points for it because of the, the just because they were one day tournaments. So we got started getting rankings for our kids and. Uh, Nice. So a lot of good things happened with that. And uh, so it, it worked out really well, I say, but then 9-11 happened and it became a little bit more of an issue um, for travel because it wasn't as convenient. Uh, it was more expensive. It was, uh, you couldn't just drop your kids off at the airport and, you know, life has right. changed. Right. Right. So, right. Yeah. So, but we saw our way through those challenges and we continue to keep our green fees at a, uh, minimum cost. We have to do a lot of fundraising, but I really just wanted our kids to have that opportunity. And I, at that time too, was with the USGA on mm -hmm. their board. And uh, weren't you the first speaking of that? Just as a, just as just for a second, <laughs> um, as a caveat there, or not a caveat uh, to elaborate on it. Um, weren't you the first player? in the history of the game to be elected to the executive board of the USGA and the first female was not the first female. Judy okay. Bell was the first female. Oh. I was the fourth. I was the fourth female. I was the first professional golfer. There was previously a golf professional. Um, I just lost his name. He owned all the Cog Hill courses in Chicago. Um, and he was a golf professional and he really wasn't, a golf professional. He owned the golf courses. So I was the first professional and uh, Nick Price is now the second. Nick. Oh, neat. Is, Nick's on their board now. I followed um, Nick when I moved from New Jersey to Arizona here to go to grad school at ASU. Yep. At ASU. Uh, I stopped on my way. I didn't plan it, but it turns out the PGA was being played in Tulsa. Hmm. And I, so I said, let's just take a little detour. And I went, and I spent an extra day and I followed Nick. Did you? And I got to meet his wife, who was all, who was a social worker. And that's what I had just left doing in Atlantic City, right? So I walked around with her all day and he ended up winning the tournament. <laughs> Isn't her name Susan? Is that her name? I, I think know. Susan. She's a really nice lady. And they're, right. they're both really nice people. Um, and that's been good for the USGA too, I think, to, to have somebody that has the perspective of the professional game on their board. Um, yeah. And because obviously they raise all their funds for their amateur championships through their professional, well, actually just through the U.S. Open. That's their one engine that makes them run. So, um, yeah. So where were we now? Are yeah, we, I interrupted right? you again. I'm my bad. Yeah, that's that's okay. Uh, <laughs> actually, probably ten. Yeah. Oh, it, the golf out here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Forgot. Oh, so I, I thought it was very important, too, that our children had an opportunity to see national championships and to qualify for the PGA Junior Championship or to qualify for U.S. Junior or Girls Junior or the pub links at those in those years, uh, which all of our kids were public players because uh, we had very few private golf courses in our state. And um, as you know, I think that they've done quite well over the years. Um, <laughs> How <have> they done? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so Kim, Kimberly Kim became the youngest to win the women's amateur. And, and she got up to uh, Pumpkin Ridge and 
she saw a billboard and she said, oh, this must be a really big tournament. You know, even though it was televised, she had no idea um, and wins that at age 13, I believe. Michelle Wee ends up winning the pub links. And, um, I'm sorry, Michelle who? Kidding. Uh, that would be Wee, w, <laughs> not W-E, but W-I-E. Right. Um, and um, Casey Watabu wins the pub links, meets Anthony Kim um, up at Gold Mountain. And so, you know, a lot of our kids went on to do some amazing things. Um, yeah. Kyung Kim wins the pub links as well. And so... A lot of them have gone on to do amazing things off the golf course as well, <coughs> as you know. Uh, and, you know, and that's a good segue actually into my next question, which is like, what would you say are the biggest life lessons that you feel are important for young golfers to learn from the game? Well, I, I think, you know, golf golf in itself, just playing the game is going to teach you all you need to learn about life. Period. Oh, that's so great. I love that. <laughs> it's just that's awesome. It's just that <laughs> simple to me. Simple as that. Um, <laughs> it's going to teach you wow. uh, how to interact with people. Mm. Um, how to, um, how, how are you going to deal with your adversities? How are you going to deal with when you get in trouble and how mm. uh, I, I always make the, you know, the analogy that I could hit, my best drive ever, you know, being the big hitter, I am 300 yards down the middle and, and best drive I've ever hit in my life. And it rolls into a divot and okay. I have a couple of ways to deal with it. I can stand there and cry and feel sorry for myself and moan and groan and make all sorts of antics, or I can look at it as an opportunity and say, wow, watch this, watch me. Because I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. And I can figure out a way. And when you look at the really great players, even Tiger, at, you know, at uh, the British Open, at the yeah, Open last yeah, week, you yeah. know, he drives it first hole into a divot. He didn't stand there and moan and groan. He looks at that as an opportunity. Um, and he wasn't happy with the results, but he didn't, you know, sit there and feel sorry for himself. Um, uh, so, and I think it's how you deal with people, how you deal with yourself, how you, because it isn't a game you're going to win every day. Um, and, um, <laughs> yeah, like how many shots go as planned? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Was it Hogan that said he hit two? Is yeah. Right. Around. Yeah. He uh, was happy. Yeah. I'd say a maximum of 18 go exactly as you wanted. Those are the ones, the putts that go in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'd be true. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's so I just think the game really in itself, and I know we like to put all the words, the first tees put a lot of words to it and and the integrity and the honesty and, you know, uh, but it just in itself and they, and they put the words to the game. Um, It will teach you exactly what you need to learn in life. So beautiful. You um, you're an amazing storyteller. What do they they say in Hawaii? Talk story. Yeah. Talk story. Yeah. I'm good at that. Yeah, you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I, you, you mentioned Joseph and I wanted to get back to him. You're six, seven boy <laughs> um, who is the, what's his title with Iration? Well, he's no longer with Iration. He's moved oh. on. Uh, he's with the band Revolution. Like, Revolution. Like a, yeah. With a B as a boy. Yep, um, and uh, and the band the green which is a hawaii band and revolution he is their uh production manager and right. sound engineer for both okay. for both those bands revolution r-e-b-e-l-u-t-i-o-n you got rebel. it rebel right. mm-hmm. okay good i like that i'm gonna look them up are they um are they, they uh they'll be well i'm i'm gonna you're gonna go see them in st louis I'm going in st louis on saturday so oh this saturday yeah, this Saturday. Are they are they touring around the country? Will they be maybe on the East Coast by any chance? I'm going to look, look it up. I'll find them. Look them up. No, look they, up. they uh, travel all Joseph, over. Joseph, I'm going to try to come find you, man, again. Yeah, yep. Did you find them? You, yep. can, you can nix me on this if you want. Um, I had a good time with Joseph last time he was here in Arizona. And we got, we went, I went to one of the shows. Yep. And, and we got together and he, he introduced me to the band. He took me oh, he did. back and I had a little um, sort of like post- uh, show rock star experience. It's pretty fun. It was pretty damn and, fun. Well, and this was with Iration. That was. Yeah, and they are such good good guys. Um, 
I'm, I'm only going to get to know revolution on this trip. I haven't, I think I've met one of them, but the iration now they're men, I call them boys, but, uh, you know, he went to high school with most of them Oh, and, did he? Yeah, on the big Island and they're oh, just really? delightful young men and, uh, they're very kind and, uh, and their music is wonderful. And same with revolution. It's, it's, uh, you can understand the words. That's what I like. <laughs> Yeah. And it's a good vibe. They vibe up. That's vibe up. They do. Right. And they all play golf, which is even oh, better. And, uh, yeah, Joseph. Uh, and that's because of Joseph. He. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, because when they first started on the road, you know, there's a lot of dead time. You're only on stage sure. for a couple hours. You're setting up for, you know, a couple hours and and you finish late and you like to sleep in. Well, he started getting them introduced uh, to the game and he, uh, they're actually sponsored by Callaway. Oh my uh, God, that's so cool! I know. So they got all this <laughs> How free fun is that? Oh, this is they got all the free equipment, and they're oh on their, man, yeah, they're on their podcast and different things, and and uh, so they all oh, start man. playing, and now they're all addicts. They're all oh, golf addicts. Maybe like Joseph Campbell said, "Follow your bliss." Good. Yep, if you exactly. Joseph, way to go! I'll find you. So <laughs> you moved out of La Jolla. You had um. So you're a Mexican food fanatic. And we went things. and ate. Yeah, right. We went and ate at your favorite uh, Mexican place that was in La Hui. Now you've moved. How, how are we doing on that? Do you have a new joint? Uh, not really. I, I uh, look forward to my times to go back to Arizona and have yes. my favorite places. Yeah. Well, let's, let's give me a couple that are your favorites. Uh, that's a good question. Don't ask you me. Go to Los Dos Molinos? Um, probably. I say, I, you know, I could go to a movie and and watch it and love it and say, I went to the movie last night. What was the name of it? I don't know. I, know, I hear you on that. Yeah. I yeah, hear you. Sorry. I don't hold that information, but I do hold, well, I know you hold the important stuff. Yeah. yeah. I wish that there was a, like a device, a counter, a clicker kind of thing that would count the number of lives that you have affected on such a profound level. I would love to know that there's probably not a number. It would be like 10 to the 8 millionth power. Well. So uh, is there anything that we missed? I have a present for you, but I want to check with you first. I have a surprise for you. Uh, is there anything that we missed that you wanted to share? Um, no, I, you know, I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, okay. I've, just, I, I've been so privileged to do the things that I've been able to do through the game, uh, you know, to serve on the USJ board, which was something that executive committee, nothing I'd ever even thought of or dreamed of. And then to go on to the board of directors for the mm. PGA of America and, and um, be instrumental in starting up the um, um, PGA Junior League, which yeah, I think PGA is Junior a, League, right? Which is a great, great program because it really gets the professional out onto the course, doing what they love to do. You know, teach the game. So you know, I hope that you take time. I'm not. You don't have to say anything to this. I'm just saying this is my wish. <laughs> that you take time every single day to celebrate you, to celebrate how, you know, one of my greatest teachers from Hawaii, the late, great Dr. Wayne Dyer. He asked, he created, crafted a question that I think is one of the most brilliant questions ever crafted. And one of the most important questions that anybody could spend time answering that I use constantly in my work and coaching people. And it is this, how do you most profoundly want to use the rest of your life? And I don't know that there, it's possible for you to have used your life more profoundly than you are. So thank you for that. Now I have a gift for you. Are you ready? I'm ready. Can you see this? I can. All right. You ready? I'm ready. Aloha, Mary B. It's me, Ryan Perez. <laughs> I just want to share a song uh, from my heart and my soul and, and express the gratitude that I, that I have for you and all that you've done for myself and for the state of Hawaii and the golfing community. So, hope you enjoy. Aloha, Mary me. Vision and actions, you 
provided a safe place to be. We provided a golfing family, a beautiful community where we could compete competitively. Oh, we meet new friends, develop the highest me. Hope you have a beautiful day and I hope you're doing well and much love. Allah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 Um, that was amazing. Um, one of the things that he said there was um, that probably means the most to me is that creating a Sorry. This, by the way, is the exact response I was hoping for. <laughs> Great. Was um, creating a safe place. Mm. Mm. And uh, mm. because that's what Thanks, Chris. <laughs> that's what golf gave for me what it was for me so mm, mm, mm. thank you you are welcome and mahalo to you i love you so much thank god for you in my world thank you chris and thank you this has been absolutely a beautiful conversation that i am so so blessed to be able to share this is like i feel like right now i feel like you know when you're going to like a birthday party and you know you're bringing to get the best gift there's nobody <laughs> has a better gift that's how i feel right now i love you love Thank you too you so give ryan a big hug for me i most certainly will yeah tell him i love him i will all right thank you uh, you know I, I coached myself before this interview don't lose it. Let her lose it. When we get to Ryan Prez, the Ryan Prez gift. You know, Ryan Prez was is a um, or was a guest is a tough talks guest vet veteran. One of I mean, his episode is one of the most viewed. As a matter of fact, the guy who just played the ukulele, a former client of mine, and I only know him because of he, you know, he was a junior golfer in the Hawaii State Junior Golf Association. So when uh, when Mary B agreed to do the podcast, I. Con well, actually, Ryan contacted me serendipitously. That's actually pretty neat. And, um, and I told him that I was interviewing her. And Ryan created that. He created that, that song. <laughs> he did it within an hour. Um, but that's just how good and talented he is. And that's also how impactful Mary B is. <clears throat> so good. God, that's so good. So beautiful. Let me talk about using your life in profound ways and showing up and creating miracles, saving lives and inspiring hundreds of thousands of other ones. So that was beautiful. And um, I'm out for now. <laughs> I'm a little spent after that. Whew. So uh, until next time, create miracles. Mm -hmm.